in just a few short years, the dream was shattered. Two more blasts went off in quick succession, and you can see this is half a dozen boats are on the horizon. And it's certainly true that the fishermen are, are, are wiping out the fish, but what's worse is they're killing the reef at the same time. I was crying in yeah. the water yeah. because it was so touched by so uselessly so many fish had yes. to die. And just in a matter of a very short time, the whole top of the outer reefs there were turned into rubble and there was nothing left. In response to the reef's distraction, an ingenious new technology is being tried and coral arcs are being built. This is going to be at first an artificial reef, which gradually in the seawater turns to be a natural reef. First phase of a, of a dream, yes, definitely. <laughs> Can the Coral Arc project save the coral reefs of Bali? It is the first tentative step. But as Mahatma Gandhi once said, it is better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. faith of the Balinese, the spirit realm is called the unseen world, a place of demons and deities, where spirits journey to their next rebirth. But surrounding Bali, there is another unseen world, the world beneath the sea. Traditionally a place of fear, it remains largely unknown and unseen. On the north coast, where the magic mountains meet the sacred sea, is one of the holiest sites in Bali. In Balinese culture, to be in harmony with the environment is as important as being in harmony with God. Overlooking Pemutaran Bay, the ancient Pulaki temples pay homage to God and to the environment. Indonesia is a nation of over 7,000 islands, but Bali is its most famous, attracting visitors from all over the world. Pemutaran, in the northwest corner, is the least developed part of the island, a long way from the bustling development in the south. A Balinese nobleman, Bapak Angung Prana, came to Pemutaran with a vision of developing a new style of resort with an emphasis on conserving nature and creating harmony with the environment. And the tourism industry need the environment or the culture to be preserved. The conservation is a must. Nobody will come if there is no cultural or environmental conservation. Inspired by Pak Prana's vision for conservation, Rani Morovoik was drawn to the beauty of Pemutran and became a partner in his resort. Rani's passion is underwater photography, and over the years she returned many times, lured by the beauty of Pemutran's outlying coral reefs. I started filming here in 95. It was one of my favorite dive sites, so I kept coming back. It's the only way with photos or video that people can actually see it because not everybody is a diver and not everybody can come here and look at it. A very, very beautiful and alive reef with huge table corals full of fish and full of life. What I loved there was the uh, cuttlefish sometimes 10 cuttlefish at a time surrounding me, which was wonderful. I've seen cuttlefish mating just very close to where they also put their eggs. A few months later, you see all these eggs in the fire coral. And I was down there and looked around and I felt happy because it was just such a thriving and beautiful reef and a beautiful time. It was not only the marine creatures, 
but the dizzying array of corals that attracted her. Around Bali and Indonesia, there are more coral species than anywhere else on the planet. As she built up her video collection, Rani had no idea these images would be the only lasting record of an entire coral reef system that was about to be destroyed. There is a concept in Bali called Sakala Nisakala, the underworld, forever in darkness, merging with our world in the light. But no one could have realized the extent of the coming darkness destined to wipe out Bali's coral reefs. In Hindu cosmology, gods and demons share the same stage, locked in an endless struggle between light and dark. In the late 1990s, a series of disasters were to impact on Bali. The Asian economic crisis hit Indonesia and the currency collapsed. Rice, the staple food, went up five times its price and a hundred million desperate people took to the roads and the seas looking for their next meal. Bali, with its booming tourist industry, offered hope. A shuttle of ferries brought waves of economic refugees from other islands. Bali's population nearly doubled, and the flood of poor and dispossessed were driven to desperation. The seas around Bali were one place people could find food, and the coral reefs became prime targets for fish bombers. Every day, bombs could be heard in Pimutran Bay. The outer reef was a war zone. But even worse was to come. In 1998, global warming overheated the oceans, causing widespread coral bleaching. Rani's favorite dive sites were in ruins. And you can actually see in 98, 99, that the reefs were getting destroyed. Actually, at that time, you couldn't go diving because there were sometimes seven to eight boats bombing and cyaniting, so it was not safe to dive there. I did go out there once, and I have the video from that time. Looks like a, a war zone, it's like a, a bomb has hit down here. Everything destroyed, like houses fallen on the ground. magnificent plate corals, home to so many fish, were gone. A deadly combination of bombs, cyanide, and finally coral bleaching killed off these magnificent living corals. The dream had become a nightmare, but even in the darkness of despair, there was a glimmer of hope. On opposite sides of the world, two men dreamed very different dreams, destined to bring new life to the shattered reefs of Bali. After praying at Pulaki Temple for help to heal the damaged environment, Pakprana was visited in his dreams by the Hindu god, Vishnu the Protector, who promised to support him in his efforts. A world away, Professor of Architecture Wolf Hilberts had long dreamed of building structures in seawater using an inspired method he calls living architecture. The global coral crisis gave urgency to Wolf's ideas. Their different visions would unite them in a common dream, saving the coral reefs of Pemutaran. While Professor of Architecture at universities in the United States, Wolf Hilberts came to an amazing realization that he could grow rock under the sea from minerals naturally occurring in seawater. The process is called mineral accretion, but it's not a new process. For millions of years, marine creatures have been using minerals dissolved in seawater to build their shells and exoskeletons. Is this is natural accretion. This animal uh, takes the naturally occurring minerals in seawater and uses it for its purposes to build its shell. 
The same is happening, of course, with corals. Corals use calcium carbonate drawn from seawater to build their exoskeletons. And uh, what we are naturally interested in for our structures are the calcium carbonates dissolved in seawater and the magnesium hydroxides. We use these materials for building purposes. So we are building these coral arcs, as we call them, because we know corals are perishing all over the world because mainly to uh, uh, global warming. We are building these arcs wherever we can to have little islands of uh, surviving corals and to preserve them as long as we can. With the backing of the Balinese dive operator, these first few structures were placed in Penutran Bay. The corals grew faster and healthier than corals on surrounding reef. The secret, an electric current is passing through the structures. These structural members are electrically conducting and I connected uh, via a electrical cable to the negative terminal of a direct current power supply. Next to it, I place in an anode, which is typically a titanium mesh, connected to the positive terminal of a direct current power supply. And now we have a galvanic cell in seawater and electrochemical reactions are taking place, causing the calcium carbonate ions and the magnesium hydroxide ions to deposit themselves here and building this structure up. The electric current actually causes limestone to grow on these structures. When settling on a substrate like this, the coral receives extra energy from the electrolytic reactions and therefore corals grow faster they have healthier extensions, they show more vivid colors, and they definitely produce higher survival rates when the unprotected reef uh, surrounding it is dying due to global warming, for instance. During the time these structures were growing, Rani continued to video and photograph. Her images are a striking record of the success of coral arc technology. That structure was put in on November 2000, just right after that, I've taken this photo, the first photo. And the second photo I've taken from the same structure, showing how successful it is. And the corals are really quite vibrant and uh, very healthy looking. For years, I felt like I was helpless to do anything against what was happening with the bombing and cyaniting. And when I saw the first structures, actually these structures you've seen on these pictures, and saw the corals and the fish so alive, I thought maybe that is the only way we can save some of the corals. So my idea was to make a nursery just in case everything else gets destroyed. The contrast between new and established structures was very dramatic and had a profound effect on Rani. She became a major sponsor of the Coral Ark Nursery. We are not in the dream. Yeah. It's real. It's real, real. We are doing something real. Not yeah. talking. Yeah. Rani, in partnership with Bakprana, commissioned Wolf to build an accretion reef in front of the resort. We are trying to save as many corals as possible, and I think uh, this is a matter of uh, the highest urgency. We are working with rebars, uh, reinforcement bars for concrete construction, which are available anywhere in the world. And we are working with uh, village welders, uh, who know their job quite well. It's not specialized labor. Uh, it can be done uh, at any place in the world. Uh, and uh, this is why we chose this material and this technology. There are more expensive ways, more precise ways uh, possible, but we don't need that and uh, we are quite content with what we have here. We are starting the Karang 1, which is an artificial reef element, which we will repeat at least three times and then we get a new design going. We want to have a multitude of designs in the water and uh, see how they perform over time. Here we see in plan uh, what we intend to build. We have a total length of 12 meters, uh, we have about 2 meters width and a height of about uh, 1 meter 20. Wolf and his team experimented with several different shapes 
some conical, others tunnel-shaped, to find out which shapes corals preferred. This towering structure he named the Nautilus. 40 centimeter. It's the first step now, and once we have the structures in the water, we'll place them, uh, connect them, and we have a growing system. To provide surfaces for coral attachment, Wolf added extra arms to the structures, using whatever metal offcuts he could lay his hands on. It's the last piece. As a matter of fact, it's a tool that we are building on right now, because we don't need the tool any longer. It looks like a piece of junk, but uh, actually it might work. As an architect, Wolf originally developed mineral accretion technology to grow building materials in seawater. But with the increasing incident of El Niños and coral bleaching events, Wolf realized the urgent need for his technology to be applied to rescuing coral reefs. As the oceans continue to heat up, so does the urgency. With global warming, what's really terrifying is that in 1998, which was the hottest year in record, about three quarters of all the reefs in the world were affected by coral bleaching. But in 1998, we saw corals die that were a thousand years old. Okay, these are corals that had been through hundreds of El Ninos in the past and had survived them all. This one killed them. Wolf's business partner is marine biologist, Dr. Thomas Goreau, an expert on coral reefs. I personally first visited Pamudaran um, in, I think, May of 98, and it was during the height of the bleaching event, and I was diving around Bali to look. Tom Goreau paints a very bleak picture for the future of the world's coral reefs. We are basically in the middle of the first human caused mass extinction of the entire ecosystem. And reefs are going to be the first ecosystem to be essentially wiped out. There will be corals surviving, but they won't be reefs. What you will find is a few corals in marginal habitats. And they'll mostly be small, they'll be isolated. Global warming leads to corals bleaching and the mass mortality of reefs through the breakdown of living coral. The intricate structure of corals are created by two separate life forms, one animal, one plant, conjoined in one of the most wonderful partnerships in the natural world. Bleaching occurs when the coral is abandoned by the algae which gives them their color, a fine covering of colored algae called zooxanthellae. The coral itself is an animal. Think of the, the zooxanthellae, those little microscopic plants. It is as if we had leaves on our body or as if we had chlorophyll inside our skin and as if we could stand out in the sun and photosynthesize and get our food simply from the sun. Well, corals are basically able to do that. They, they catch food that's floating in the water and eat it, but at the same time, they're also plants. Now, without the, the plants, they're losing a major source of nutrition. But the other thing that's even more critical is that when the coral loses its algae, it completely stops growing its skeleton. It also stops reproducing. It's basically in a state of starvation. It's severely stressed. Even if it doesn't die, a bleached coral is essentially sort of one step short of death. Just as the zooxanthellae help feed the corals, the coral reefs have helped to feed the fishing community of Pimutaran. For generations, local fishermen hunted the seas for their livelihood. Their fathers and grandfathers never had to think about conservation. They just went out to the reefs and caught lots of fish. This is one of the poorest villages in Bali, dependent on fishing for its survival. And as the reefs deteriorated, so did the fishing. Fishermen are having to travel further and are returning with much smaller catches. With the encouragement of Pak Prana and a local dive operator, the village created a reserve to try to protect their corals. I came here to Pamutaran because the village had established a protected area. And I was delighted to hear that. I felt it meant that the, the villagers were people who were taking a stake in their own future and trying to protect what they had and nurture it along. And what I was very impressed to see was that this was a protected area that had been declared by the villagers themselves. The reserve is close to shore, but since the economic collapse, the village couldn't protect their outlying reefs. And in the late 1990s, bombing got out of hand. 
Well, there were two more blasts that went off in quick succession, and there's this out in that direction someplace. We were standing here when they went off, but we didn't see any plume go up, so it's hard to say quite where it is, but you can see there's this half a dozen boats are on the horizon. Well, I mean, it's been illegal for many years, but the law's never been enforced properly. Uh, this is slightly absurd. Uh, one tries to be productive here to build the situation up, and, uh, you know, at the same time, you hear these blasts that uh, the reef is being destroyed out there. Bombing was once promoted by government as the most effective way to catch fish. It's well established, and there's enormous resistance to change. We're at a critical moment here. That if, if the village can't really get their act together and protect it, what we're doing will be a waste of time. But we're, we're optimistic, because they've made a lot of very progressive decisions, and they've done it on their own, and that, that gives us some hope for the future. Another fishing practice destructive to the reef is potassium cyanide poisoning, used to stun and capture fish live for sale to the international aquarium market. These small, brightly coloured fish are worth more than food fish, and many fishermen are switching to this trade. The thing about them that makes them easy to catch is they live in the branches of corals. They will not desert that coral. So they swim around in the waters eating plankton, but then they dash back into the coral for safety. So what the cyanide fisherman does is approach the coral, all the fish go and hide it, and he squirts it with cyanide. It stuns some, kills many more, and leaves the coral dead, but still standing to become overgrown with algae. And hundred thousands of them lying on the bottom of the reef and just dying. And just to see that, especially since I love to look at them and photograph them and video them. Um, the village had decided to actually take action and stop the bombing and cyanide fishing, which is an incredible success. Without that, it could not be done. Sponsored by local yes. resorts and dive shops, Pemutran leaders formed the Pichalang Laut, or People Police. Villagers who set out on daily patrols, guarding their bay and outlying reefs from bombers and cyanide fishermen. Millions of people live on boats all over Indonesia, stripping resources as they go. Maybe the traditional fishing or the aquarium fishing. So we can These it. itinerant fishermen have no long-term stake in the future. They just take what they can and move on to damage another area. I the traditional fishing, fishing by the line. We can check the, the small boat, that's, that's where. Because the seas are common property, owned by everyone, they're cared for by no one. A resource is exploited until it is wiped out. This is a dilemma facing fisheries worldwide. Rani came along on this patrol to video fishing methods. We're gonna go in the water. Check out how they're doing it. Since we're right here next to a boat catching aquarium fish, I'd like to see if they actually really use the method they're saying they're using, which is by net. I will be able to tell if there are fish lying around dead. I know it was cyanide. They sort of sneak towards the net and push the fish, and then they quickly take the net and pull it up together. I could never hold my breath for that long amount of time. They were able to do that. They were quite skillful. They knew exactly which corals to go to for certain fish. They were looking for the very colorful ones, the blue ones, and the other ones they actually threw out back into the ocean, the ones they didn't like. The people of Pomotoran were not afraid to go out and stand up and say, if you can't dynamite anymore or you can't use potassium anymore for fishing. If they do, they will give them a fair warning twice, and then the third time they will arrest. This daily vigilance is working. Neither of the two boats boarded were using fishing methods which would destroy corals. But back in March of 2002, a fleet of five boats bombed the reefs for a passing school of tuna. The village Pechelang took decisive action. It was a big team of bombers, so they called in armed police. They had the bombers arrested, impounded their boats and bombs, and put the offenders in jail. The bombers used homemade waterproof bombs with short fuses, dangerous to the bombers, 
and devastating to the reefs. Launch time for the coral nursery and the start of the strangest procession ever to cross Pamutran Beach. A team of young men recruited from the resort and dive shops lend a hand. Wolf believes community support is essential for the project's success. Here we have community involvement. They want to better their environment. They want to take an active hand in, in doing so. And they are very, very interested. Over the next few days, a coral arc nursery will be installed, scattered over a two hectare reserve, a couple of hundred metres long and parallel to shore, directly in front of the resort. Two more metres in diving, diving, please. The structures are placed within 200 metres of shore in water 6 to 10 metres deep. The growing structures will attract snorkelers and divers to the resort. These coral arcs will help corals survive global warming, bleaching and other environmental stresses. They will grow a range of different coral species and their healthy spawn will help to repopulate the outlying reefs. The Balinese divers are all from the village and local dive shops are supporting the community effort providing boats and gear. Tom and Wolf have placed trial structures in a number of sites from the Indian Ocean to the Caribbean. But with a total of 21 coral arcs, this is by far the largest mineral accretion reef in the world. This roll of mesh is the anode, which receives the positive electrical current. It looks like chicken wire, but is made from a revolutionary combination metal which makes the whole process possible. The material is titanium covered with a special oxide of rare metals and you can shoot high current densities through this anode uh, material without disintegrating it. Under normal conditions as we use it, it holds up for years in the seawater, which no other combination metal uh, does. Chicken wire would disintegrate within a couple of hours. It would have corroded and disappeared into the sea. The anode mesh is positive, the cathode structure negative. Like a car battery, it needs both to make an electric circuit for accretion to take place. So this is the first anode cable we bring on land. Now we can establish electrical power and the system begins to grow. So this is always a little triumph to get so, so far. <sighs> I'm just preparing a cable to be hooked up to the power supply, which is, of course, a direct current power supply. Ordinary battery charges are used. Good, it works. It's all the way to the max. Uh, that's okay. It, it will stand it for a little while. Let's do exactly the same, 12 volts. So yeah. this indicates the, the electrical current is flowing it's, it's between the anodes up. and the different yeah. cathodes that are around it. If the voltage is too high, accretion will happen too rapidly and lose its strength. The low current is cheap to run and safe to use. Here we go. We are online. Right. Now right. the needle is most likely going to be a little bit erratic. Beginning of accretion, it will be a, a very fine white film which is forming on the structure. Uh -huh. And this film will grow and grow. And there's a lot of rust which is going to be reformed now. The rust becomes metal again. And this will happen over the next few hours and uh, then we will see 
It's the beginning of accretion. It will be a, a very fine white film which is forming on the structure. The negative electric current slightly raises the pH on the surface of the metal, causing accretion to occur. As it grows, the structures will become solid walls of limestone, covered in corals. Tom and Wolf's inspired technology actually mines the ocean, growing industrial strength rock straight from seawater. What we have here is a piece of mineral accretion, a cross section through a structural member. And we see here the rebar, the metal, conductive metal. And the mineral accretion grew around the rebar here. That one was in the water for about two years, but mineral accretion was uh, happening for about a year, about 12 months. This has mechanical properties of about a uh, lightweight concrete. Uh, this is Kamang. He lives here in Bali and is a dive master and also learning the trade of mineral accretion. He will be in charge of these electrical connections plus a few other things and if necessary he will be able to repair everything. So we are teaching them to do our job when we are gone and uh, to expand the project and so on. So they will become experts. Yes, certainly, because if a wire breaks in a storm and it doesn't get replaced, that's the end of uh, the mineral accretion project right there. And be so, careful. You know, we'll have a structure remaining, but it will no longer be growing, and the corals on it will no longer be getting the boost that they get. The first corals are collected and wired onto the structures. They would take too long to grow from spawn, and Tom believes that in the global coral crisis, time is of the essence. We're collecting broken fragments of corals to transplant onto the coral nursery. And what we're looking for are pieces that are lying all over the bottom. It's a steep reef slope. There are branching corals. Many of them have been damaged by physical factors, apparently, here. And uh, they've fallen into the mud at the bottom of the slope. And there they're just kind of being buried in the mud and being carried down to deeper water. What we're trying to do with the coral arcs is, is essentially to build habitat to maintain corals through the global warming crisis, or at least as far into it as we can manage. Uh, this coral has bleach, uh, and this coral hasn't, so that's the difference. So our, our effort is to try to grow coral populations that are more resistant to stresses, in particular the stresses that we know are going to be hitting them with global warming. The coral nursery will help determine which corals are more resistant to bleaching and other stresses bound to hit them with global warming. In a sense, what we're doing is a coral hospital because we're trying to take corals that would otherwise die. We're rescuing them, in a sense, and we're trying to get them to grow and form much larger colonies that we will then propagate. But most species that we picked up here today would have normally died by themselves. Once this tie wire makes contact with the metal, it stops rusting, becomes part of the structure, and begins accreting. The entire structure is alive. Earlier experiments have achieved growth rates three to five times faster than peak growing rates of corals in places where surrounding corals have died. The corals that we're growing are much healthier than normal corals. And the reason for that is that the normal coral has to use a lot of its energy to grow its skeleton. Our corals are getting that energy for free. We're creating the conditions that allow very rapid growth of limestone, both chemically and biologically, through our process. So the result is they have much more energy left over for growth and for reproduction. And they also have more energy for resisting stress. There is another application of accretion technology which could have profound impact on all our lives. The reef is the most effective form of coastal protection against erosion that exists. It's a growing, wave-resistant barrier that may get clobbered by a hurricane and broken up, and it grows back up, and it's constantly growing up towards sea level and regenerating itself. The fact that almost all reefs are severely damaged means that those corals are not growing up and regenerating and forming a wave-resistant barrier. In fact, they're collapsing and disappearing. So the result of this is now the wave forces are hitting the shore with much greater energy and causing much more erosion. But if we have to build a seawall to protect the coastline, the typical cost of a seawall built of concrete or rock worldwide is of the order of $15 million per kilometer. Well, there are thousands and thousands of kilometers of coastline that are eroding worldwide. 
that is going to probably be the biggest cost of global warming. It's only when you need to build seawalls, import fish, and find other jobs for your population of lost tourism that we will appreciate the true value of the reef. Global warming is currently causing sea levels to rise around two millimeters a year. But with changing weather patterns and more extreme weather, some places already feel threatened. Many island states, especially the low-lying island states, uh, will be inundated. Uh, the time frame uh, we are talking about is perhaps uh, between 50 and 150 years. Uh, it will be land under and uh, so it won't exist any longer. But long before that will happen, uh, storm surges will become more extreme and we will reclaim more and more land and ultimately people will find that those islands are not inhabitable any longer and will be forced to leave. Mineral accretion doesn't just work in the tropics. The process will grow rock wherever there is seawater, protecting coastlines in cool and temperate waters throughout the world, growing at rates many times faster than sea level rise. Accretion technology will provide another benefit for the people of Bimutran. In the sea, we're still hunters, we're not farmers. What we're trying to do really is kind of push fishermen who can no longer be hunters because there isn't anything left to hunt, to growing the, the food instead of simply wiping out the, the wild stock. The simple idea of farming the open sea by creating protected habitat could revolutionize fishing practices worldwide. Within days of being installed, the coral arcs were inundated by masses of schooling fish. What you have to understand is that right here, the fishermen in this village are going out five or ten kilometers out to sea. They're going to the offshore banks. Those banks have had their, their corals almost totally destroyed by, by dynamite and by cyanide. They're out there all day and, you know, they, they're getting a, a handful of fish at the end of the day. But every day when they go out to those dead reefs, they have to cross over the reefs who've been growing right here near shore that are 50 meters in front of where they live in many cases. And they see that those areas are full of fish. So it's an irresistible temptation. I mean, you know, why go five kilometers to catch nothing when you, you have it 50 meters in front of you? I'm not surprised that a few fishermen have been unable to control themselves. They're hungry. We've been working mainly here on growing coral habitat, but we can build fish habitat, we can build lobster habitat, we can build oyster or clam habitat as well. We need to be working more closely with the fishermen to really turn them into being farmers in the future because their children can't be hunters. Just, this just isn't going to be a resource for them. If we don't work with the fishermen, turn them into farmers instead of hunters, they're, they're going to have no choice but to destroy all our conservation efforts because there won't be any other place to find the fish that they want. After a number of night fishing raids on the structures, the entire project was in peril. So a meeting with village leaders was held. It was decided to ask Tom and Wolf to build new structures as dedicated fish habitat to help increase fish stocks in the bay. The difference this time is that we take a material which is rolled, so it has innate curves in it and we are going to use these curves directly. We are going to cut about three spirals out of this roll and sink them in various locations and positions as well. Spirals which are open towards the sky or spirals that are open towards the sides. After some time, we'll see what kind of construction is preferred by the local fishers here. It has breeding grounds, hiding spaces, and so on. So I guess uh, we will have three fish reefs cut out of this roll with two people in between uh, two or three hours, which is incredible. And uh, then the task of sinking begins and the task of wiring the such up. Uh, why they start the fishery project? Because we now know the fish will come if there are houses for them. Pakokum Prana, my partner here, has played a very big role in convincing the village and also talking to media. All for the benefit of the village. Yeah. yeah. Number one, technology, yes. I think it's Funding, yes. But 
Community involvement is the key to the project's success, and Rani does her bit to spread the word. I'm uh, working on a five to seven minutes documentary about the project we are doing here in Pamutaran. And then Putu will then speak the narration for it so the Indonesians can also understand. A, a combination of disasters, economic and environmental, maybe mm -hmm. that is easier for you okay. to translate. Yeah. Yes. Both of those together. Together, yeah. And mm -hmm. both of them impacted, it is like, you know, just yes, like a strong. Right, yeah. Rani's videos have been vital in bringing the unseen world to community awareness. She's completing her documentary for screening at the National Conference on Coastal Management. And the mini documentary is a hit with village leaders, fishermen and the Pechelang Patrol. Documentary they could understand the impact the destruction has and how important it is to protect it. I think they loved it all. In fact, the village chief came to me and said he wants to have it on CD because that's the only way he can play it. And he wants the whole village to see it because it is uh, very convincing, uh, apparently. It is amazing. All happened at the same time. Lately, we have the national conference about the coast potential. And in the conference, they decided to present us a national awards. At the National Conference on Coastal Management, Penmutaran's Coral Protection, or Karang Lestari project, as it came to be called, won first prize. It is hoped the victory will inspire other coastal communities to set up similar projects and begin looking after their coral reefs. And it has come now to a point where the politicians are even listening and wanting to know about it. This project is the first of its kind in Indonesia and the largest of its kind in the world. The huge success has helped instill a sense of pride in the community. In the Balinese style, preparations are underway to celebrate the blessing and launching of the five new fish structures. National awards help to maintain long-term support for the project, but nothing will reward the community as much as when their boats start returning home with a decent catch of fish. This ceremony is a kind of a blessing ceremony. To purify all the structure which is, will be going down to the ocean, but before that, as a Hindus and traditional Hindus way that we have to get a permission from the God of the ocean, as well as uh, purifying all this structure. On the morning of the ceremony, an auspicious sign. The god of the ocean sent a special blessing to the Karang Lestari project. I see cow or dugong. It's apparently out there and I'm going to try to get it on camera. By snorkeling only this time. In Balinese society, a duyung is for a good spirit. But then since it's appeared here in the Bay of Pomutara, it is believed the transformation of the spiritual energy in the shape of duyung. In the shape of a beautiful woman with a fish tail. So in the Balinese society, the blessing can be in any form. So we are really very grateful that our effort is being blessed from the dream, from the action, and now the coral growing with blessing. National television crews visited Pemutaran several times, and ripples of success are being felt overseas. Rani's video helped the project win an ecotourism award in Australia. The five fish structures are towed to their new home where they will be wired up for mineral accretion. These structures will become a protected area, free from fishing, 
Fish thriving in the structures will help to repopulate the bay and outlying reefs. Creating protected reserves where fish can breed alongside fishing areas is a model Tom believes could resurrect sustainable fishing throughout the world. What we're trying to do is train the fishermen to realize that they could be growing a reef and harvesting the fish without damaging the corals, and that way, if they do it right, they'll have food forever. Good, good. <laughs> Excellent, as a matter of fact, yes. This is what we are dreaming to have with all the efforts and the support of the village. And they are also very grateful to see this beyond their expectations. We have to be in harmony. Harmony with our God, in harmony with our environment, in harmony with men. If we are in harmony with the God, with people all over the world and in the environment, so this becomes a paradise. If corals throughout Indonesia are to be reborn, it is essential for coastal communities to take charge of their offshore reefs and, like the people of Pemutran, learn to farm their seas. Done. For the first time since reef protection began, Rani and her longtime diving companion Chris Brown head offshore to check the outlying reefs. The important thing for me was that I at least try to do something. Not only sit back and cry about all the reefs which have been destroyed, but actually do something to help. can see little patches of corals coming back. That gives me hope that it will eventually be a beautiful reef again if it's left alone. That was my goal when we started building these structures because I was hoping that at least we can preserve some of the corals before they totally die, but now with the protection happening, it's a much bigger chance that the reef will come back and it will work not only for Pamutra but maybe also for other parts of Indonesia. I've come to love the Balinese in Bali over the last 13 years, 14 years. They have given me so much and they've treated me so well in all these times that for this it was important for me also to give something back and that it was my gift back to the Balinese. <laughs>